What we're going to look at in this video is the economic way of thinking, some basic principles for understanding the economic way of thinking. If we look at economics as a study of human behavior and decision making, well, there are some basic principles that economists view that are important to understand human behavior. Number one, people are motivated by their own interests. Number two, people respond to incentives. People, every action incurs a cost. Tanstoffel is a Milton Friedman acronym, meaning there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Sunk costs are sunk and should be ignored. Efficient choices are made at the margin. Choices are almost always made with uncertainty, and actions often result in unintended consequences. We're going to cover the first three in this video, and then four, five, six, and seven in part two. So the first one is that people are motivated by their own interests, or people are self-interested. And this is often mischaracterized that people are greedy and selfish and lacking of concern for other people. And this isn't what is meant by the argument of self-interest, and certainly not the way Adam Smith talked about it. Adam Smith was a moral philosopher and the founder of modern-day economics, and he understood and discussed sympathy. Today we'd call it empathy, uh, and why we act justly and virtuously. And those are essential. For a social order to be successful, people have to work and act with a system of justice and act virtuously. And we also have to have charity towards others. So he understood that, and he wasn't discounting that. His basic argument is these things don't motivate people. What motivates me to serve your interest, what motivates me to serve your interest is what I get in return. Matter of fact, Smith talked about this when he said it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own self-interest. So we don't address ourselves to their humanity to please take care of us. We address their humanity by giving them something because we know they're self-interested just like we are. And so this is just basically what motivates and what he was talking about, what motivates, not what should direct us. So if we're not going to work in our own interests, whose interests should we work for? Should we work for the interests of others? Should we be altruistic? This is a great piece by Mao Yushi, who talked about the gentleman society and used an example of somebody who makes pots or fixes pots. And so that's something, you know, in the past, let's do something today, say fixing computers. Should I fix computers for free? Well, if you think about it, if it's free, if something does not cost me anything, the value to me of getting it fixed is zero. It can be zero. It may be more, but it, as long as somebody's going to do it free, I don't have to have any value for it. And therefore, do we want people using their resources, their skills, to do things that people don't have any value for? And so if I'm working on computers for free, I will have no shortage of people wanting computers fixed. I need to make sure that I'm taking care of the people who value their work most. And that only happens by charging prices and taking care of me. And this is an important element that Mao Yushi talked about of solving the information and the incentive problems. How can we be certain that you're allocating your time and serving the greater good if you don't have something like prices? So think of also grades. If we socialize grades, how would your behavior change? Would you actually work as hard as you do? And that's the important part of self-interest that Smith is talking about. Altruism neither ameliorates conflict nor reduces competition for scarce resources. They will always be there. Even if we had a society where everybody worked in the interests of others, we still have scarcity, which is conflict. That's always going to happen. When we think of self-interest, we also think of marriage. A lot of people think of, you know, we can't talk about love when we're talking about economics. That's dispassionate. But actually, it's a very, very important point. You marry out of self-interest. If you're marrying somebody, if you're interested in marrying somebody because you pity them and want to take care of them, you might want to rethink your choice. I married my wife because I could get something from her, companionship. We work together. We raise kids together. I did it for my own interests. Now, as part of that, I work to serve her interests. Number two is people respond to incentives. Change the costs and benefits of an action and people respond accordingly. And you think of a great example, and this one was 18th century Britain. Uh, you know, Australia was the a penal colony for Great Britain. And what they would do is they would pay shippers to transport criminals, convicted criminals, to Australia. And more than a third would die on the way there. And nobody wanted that to happen. They weren't sentencing these criminals to death. And so, therefore, they wanted to change things. How would you change this? I'll give you a hint. They paid the shippers as the passengers, the convicts, boarded the ship. 
and then if more than a third would die. How would they change it? Pay them when the prisoners get off the ship, and sure enough, the number of people dying on the ship fell to almost zero. Now I have a vested interest. You change the incentives. A liquor store in Georgia wanted people to wear masks during the pandemic. How did they get them to do it? How did they incentivize them? Give them a discount, a 3% discount on your purchase if you wear a mask. How do we, you know, spending habits change when you're spending somebody else's money, right? If I give you money and I say, well, go get something and bring it back for, as a group, you're not really going to be concerned as much. But if I, you're spending your own money for you, your incentives change. I always like to use this example here. In 1972, the American League and uh, the Major League Baseball instituted the designated hitter rule where a pitcher does not go up to bat. They designate a, a, another person, another player, to hit in the pitcher spot. So that was instituted in 1972. What do you predict happened to the number of hit batters in the American League relative to the National League after 1972? The National League continued on with having the pitcher bat. And sure enough, the number of batters hit in the American League increased by 20% relative to the National League. As long as a pitcher does not have to face the opposing pitcher and doesn't get a risk of, face the risk of being hit, then the cost is zero of hitting another one of the other players. And so it did happen. I was also like to ask, should football players wear helmets? There's a lot of concern about head injuries. Well, one of the problems with head injuries is because helmets are becoming apparently so much safer, I'm leading with my helmet and driving it in as if it's a hammer. And if you want to stop players from doing that, take the helmets off. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating that, but I think this idea that safer helmets is the answer actually might make them worse. Another way of looking at this, people respond to incentives, firefighters in Sicily were paid by the number of fires they put out. How do you think they responded to this? Sure enough, they started fires. How might computer programmers respond to an incentive scheme that pays them for each bug they fix uh, in a program and then fix it? And so they find a bug, they fix it. Well, sure enough, they started writing bugs into programs so they could find them, fix them, and get paid more money. And that's just how people respond to incentives. If you change the costs and benefits of an outcome, people will change their behavior. And number three is Tanstoffel. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And what this means is every action incurs a cost. And we must be looking at these costs because they are trade-offs. By default, every time you choose between two preferences, you incur a cost. These are trade-offs. Number one is explicit cost. This would be money out of your pocket, a monetized cost. If you look at college, you're paying tuition and you're paying for books. Those are monetized costs, opportunity costs. So those are explicit. The implicit cost is the time you're not in working. You're out of the workplace making money. That's a cost. That's an implicit cost. And there are also hidden costs. Hidden costs would be something you don't see, such as when birds get, uh, birds and fish and other fowl, you know, fowl and other animals are saturated with oil in the Gulf of after an oil spill. Well, your driving helped perpetuate that. Your driving helped cause that because we need oil, there are going to be accidents, and therefore that would be a hidden cost. Thomas Sowell once said there are no solutions, only trade-offs, and that's probably the best way of looking at it. I use this as an example. Uh, during this pandemic, there's been a lot of concern about opening schools, and some people say the risk of, you know, might be small for children, but that's a lot of children. This data is not even correct. This data is not correct, by the way. It's far, far less than this percentage. But what the question is not being asked is, what are the other concerns? How else are kids dying? And it ends up that you have a greater likelihood of a child dying at home from accidental poisoning than you do of being in school and getting COVID. And so when we want to look at trade-offs, we're always looking at the cost of everything, not just the one side. One of my favorite examples in terms of the implicit costs is this one here where somebody posts on Facebook about watching people stand in line for more than half an hour to get a free iced tea at Starbucks. Well, a half hour of your time in that heat uh, doesn't seem to make sense when you can go in and get a, star a iced tea for $1.50 at the store. If your time is worth $15 an hour, you're basically spending $7.50 for a quote unquote free iced tea. So the basic idea behind specialization and trade is also this opportunity cost. When you're doing something, you're not doing something else, and therefore we want to look at that allocation.
So one thing I always think of with costs is think of something you really, really want but don't currently have. And yeah, think big but be realistic. Don't think of like world peace or world domination. Think of something really big that you don't currently have now. And the question is, why don't you have it? And most people say, well, I don't have the money. Well, you could have had the money. You could drop out of school. You could go work, sell all your possessions. And what you're talking about is you don't really want that bad enough to give up other things you have. And that one thing that you're thinking about right now that you really want is the trade-off for doing the things you're doing now, such as going to college or driving a car. Like, I want a beautiful home in the mountains. Or really, do I? If I really wanted that, wouldn't I have it already and not have a bunch of other things? So I want a bunch of things. I want it all. I can have it all. The home in the mountains is what I'm sacrificing for what I'm currently doing now. One of the best illustrations of... Uh, Tanstoffel that I find is Otto Dix's painting of the nun. This is up at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York City and it's just an outstanding portrait of a nun who is agonizing over her choice. What are the things that she has given up to become a nun and what would she not have? So if you look at the to the her, the, her left on her head, maternal instinct. She's not going to be a mother. She's going to not have the sexuality that a person would normally have. She's giving that up. And on the right side of her head is Christ on the cross. And that's what her, she's looking for that eternal, longer term benefit. If she wanted the, the, the children, she'd be giving up that other longer term. So she's torn between these things because she can't have it all. She can't have it all. They're constraints by nature. Some things we can't have, such as we can only grow so much, and they're constraints by rules. Some rules that limit what we can do. And these things are always going to be costs. And so one thing I always look at, what is the cost of you attending college? And there are many different things with that, but the bigger thing we're going to look at, tuition, books, and then room and board is not an opportunity cost because you would have to have been paying somewhere to live and eat anyway, but those first two are. This is the end of part one. We'll come back to four, five, six, and seven in part two.